Yes, we are back and there is no Connor. So the kids are free to run about and do whatever it is we want to do. It's the fans forum. It's the it's the reason all for United exists. It's so that you guys can put your voice in and tell us exactly what you think. And my goodness, there's a few things to talk about already. Uh, we have said goodbye to Lucy Staniforth. She has left and thank you for your service. And rumoured there might be more. Who knows? Was that a hint? I don't know. More? Mm, maybe. There's rumours there. Um, with lots of people that potentially might be going off. Grace Clinton potentially out on loan as well. So moving and shaking. Are we getting anybody coming in? Um, certainly. There's one or two thoughts that are being thrown around. So we're going to have a little bit of a transfer season conversation to begin with, because we know that's what everybody seems to love and enjoy. So we shall throw a little bit of that around. And then once we've dined on that spectacular starter, we shall get down onto the nitty gritty, um, which is to really start talking about what we can do and how we're going to influence uh, women's football going forward as a whole. You know, what should we expect from our decision makers? But before we do that, as you will see, um, I, I scoured the country, the world, the universe, the globe, in fact, uh, to try and get ourselves a cracking first panel. And I think you'll be absolutely in agreement with me that we have come up trumps. We've got all of your personal favourites here. We have Helen, we have Sarah and we have Charlie. And I'm very much looking forward to getting into it. Um, so before we do, let's just have a quick double check. Helen, everything all right? We had a good Christmas and we all enjoyed the revival of the men's side as well and everything that's going on, ready for the women to start at the weekend. Yeah, yeah, all good, thank you. Yeah, L loving Man United football at the moment. So long may oh, it continue. <laughs> absolutely. And Sarah, how's things been for you? Yeah, good. Uh, likewise, I'm enjoying everything getting started again after Christmas, uh, enjoying the men's game as well. Things are looking good right now. Excellent. And uh, Charlie, I understand you got yourself uh, a beautiful new present for Christmas as well. Yes. Uh, who's, on, who's on the back? Uh, Zellum, El Capitano, as El promised. Capitano. Uh, in everyone's favourite luminous yellow, yellow lagoon top. Uh, yeah, please, please. I can't. It was, it was, was it before Christmas? The last one I was on. I've had to. Probably, I've had to, yeah. I've had to parent my own children with school being out, which is unfortunate. Um, but have enjoyed. Uh, Lots of positive football for United men. So, fingers crossed, the women all, all pick up where they left off. Absolutely. And it will be a big one. If you're looking for a preview on Liverpool, we will absolutely be bringing that to you on Friday as ever. But, um, and you'll probably enjoy it even more because I won't be there. I'll be away for the weekend. So, who is Connor going to bring in uh, in my position? I can't wait to see. I'll be watching. So, we shall see. Right. Lucy Staniforth, she's gone. Um, let's just go straight in with it, shall we? Helen, are you bothered? Am I bothered? Oh dear. Um, Am I bothered? Am I bothered now? <laughs> yeah. That reminds me of that, yeah. Um, I think it's not that big a loss, if I can say that, without any fans coming for me. Um, she wasn't getting the game time, was she? She was unlucky with injuries. Um, and even though some people are saying with the Birmingham connection with Mark, she, he didn't really choose her in the last sort of season maybe two seasons. So I think um, the competition for places sort of just made her and her age maybe just made her sort of on the on the fringes of the squad. So not really surprised she's gone. But while she was there, I think she did a good job, good enough. So. Absolutely. I would fully agree with that. And and Sarah, what, what's your thoughts when, when you look back on the career at Manchester United of Lucy Staniforth? Whereabouts is she going to rank for you? Uh, in terms of things that she's done and the, the the way in which she's helped the club to move forward. Um, yeah, I'd be very much in agreement with the two of you. I think she's been a great servant to the club while she's been there, but it was probably the right time for her to move on and it, a move she needed to make, really. I mean, she's 30 now. She'll be eyeing up a place in the England squad for the World Cup and... She just needs the minutes, really. And I think I think it's a good signing for Villa. It is a good signing for Villa, absolutely. Carla Ward's obviously been watching here and, and noticed that we talk a lot about her Barbie army and how good she is. So maybe she's coming for fourth spot, Man City. You should watch out. Charlie, 
talk to me about Lucy Staniforth. We, we've stood next to each other many a time. Um, there's been moments where we've seen Lucy come on and we weren't necessarily expecting her. She's played in different positions around the, mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of the attacking end of the of the pitch. What, what's your thoughts on the news that Lucy's leaving or has left? Um, <clears throat> I think at the time we got her, we were in a in a place where we kind of needed players like her who have sort of more experience of playing the WSL because we were quite a young squad when, when we first came up. So that, that first year when Casey was there, I think that was when she came. She was probably the sort of player that we needed. Um, I think with the trajectory we we're on and with what we want to wanting to achieve, she was never going to have longevity at the club. Um, she was also increasingly like she was made of glass, which is also a bit of a problem, um, permanently injured. Um, and, you know, I suppose lots of people who are crying out for, for people like Vilda to get more minutes, which is probably something I would like to see. It probably increases the likelihood of that happening. So things like this happening might increase the likelihood of Boris perhaps staying if she gets more minutes, which I think for some people will be quite a positive thing. Um, and I'm all for Carla Ward trying to build a Vets team. If that's what she wants to do, um, she has to go for it. Why not? Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. But this this has been, I think, the, scrolling through Twitter, seeing how fans are interacting mm -hmm. and what they're saying at the moment. This seems to be the sort of the key bone of contention, really. We all know that, that Lucy had her contract renewed at the end of last season. So... Here we are, what are we on, five, six months down the line, and <clears throat> basically terminated the contract. We've allowed her to leave uh, mm -hmm. without a fee for Villa. Where do we stand on that one? Because I did see there was one tweet saying it doesn't matter how small the fee is, we should be looking for a fee. Are we not in a situation where if we know she's not going to get the game time that she requires, then it's best to have her off the wage bill? Where, where do we stand on sort of the termination idea. Um, Sarah, what's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I thought it was a strange decision. I mean, I know Mark Skinner said that with, you know, six months left on our contract, it was, it, it made sense. But I just, I can't help but see it as a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, just, yeah, and just, you know, the idea of adding to the, the budget as well for bringing in more players, I thought that would have been a helpful thing to do. So it just seems strange that we didn't capitalise on that. And obviously Villa have just signed Jordan Nobbs as well from Arsenal and, you know, have obviously made some money off that, I, I think, as far as I know. So, yeah, it's a strange one for me, I think. Yeah, very much so. I think it's uh, it is an interesting one. John's putting out the Christmas cracker jokes already, but asked for the club to cancel her contract as a wedding present. <laughs> um, maybe that's what she wanted. Maybe there was, you know, like they often send out these gift lists, don't they? Things that I would like. And maybe what <laughs> she was just running through like toaster, you know, king size bed, contract terminated United so I can join Carla Ward. I don't know. Um, we'll never know whether that's the case or not. Um, but Helen, should we have been getting money for this? Where, where do we stand on the whole Lucy Stan money? Would we have got much for her? I mean, when we look at how much it is, 250 grand, 300,000 potentially being sort of the highest amount spent so far, what sort of level do you think we could have got for Lucy had we had we asked for a little bit of moolah from, from Carla? Um, I don't know. I suppose maybe the, the offset of her wage was worth, was, was going to be, worth more to the club than getting a fee for her. Um, I don't know, maybe a, a couple of thousand. Um, the club should get straws, I've no idea, but... Um, was going for 40, does that seem reasonable to you? 40,000. 40,000, yes. Uh, mm, I was thinking more below 10,000, but maybe I'm being harsh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, it was obviously some sort of business decision. Time will tell if it was good business or bad business, but... Um, she clearly wasn't an important player in the first 11 every week so she was sort of deemed surplus to requirements for the reasons we've mentioned age injury record etc so they obviously just thought it's in the best interest to terminate the contract despite the renewal um, however it looks on the outside is they've just taken the hit as it were I think 
absolutely there's some amazing figures coming in here so you've gone for for less than ten thousand. it's like an auction isn't it uh at this point connor i believe this is connor unless somebody's been ghosting in on the old wolf united chat there he's saying about 20k ish uh he's thinking john commodes going between 20 and 40 he wouldn't have been very good on the price he's right You've definitely got to pick one, but thirty-nine thousand I've seen, uh, fifty to seventy-five thousand according to uh, uh, to Mister Fry. There, he seems to have money to burn. Um, where, where would you go, um, Charlie? Which sort of level would you go at? A couple of things, really. I would, like, there's lots of comparison to what Arsenal got for Jordan Nobbs, who I know has had her injuries as well, but I think she is also on a different level as a footballer to to Lucy Sanaforth. Nobbs, when she is fit, I would say she's world class. Some people might laugh at that, but I think she is, and she has been for a long time. She's one of the, she's one of the few players who has been around for ten years and doesn't look like a footballer who trained ten years ago. She looks like a footballer who's start, started at now and is technically really gifted, which is unusual for someone who's been around that long. Um, and I would also say they might just want off the wage bill. I find terminating the contract quite interesting. I would really like to know what's gone on there. I have no idea, but that's bizarre um so i wonder if there is more to this than meets the eye but obviously we will never know quite rightly because things stay in house if they've gone on um but also for for man united at the moment as skint as they might be across the board i think getting getting ten thousand for it is negligible um that that is not a priority there will be other priorities um that come ahead of of getting that and I, to be honest i'm not I'm not majorly. I'm just not majorly fussed about it. I think when when Stana Forth was at the club, she wasn't maligned, but it was like, well, don't don't know why she's playing ahead of this player. She sort of she's past her best. We maybe don't need on the wage bill, and then she's gone for free, and it's like she's turned into some sort of Ballon d'Or winner. How how could this? Have, how could she have gone for nothing? Well, I, I just think in the grand scheme of things, it's not a, it's not a massive deal. Um, what will be more of a problem for me is if Russo and Honor walk out the door in the summer for nothing. That That's the bigger issue rather than the Lucy Sanaforth one. I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, like you said, 10, 20, 30,000. In the grand scheme of things, <clears throat> it's peanuts to a club like Manchester United, really, whether we're in the middle of a takeover or not. So I, I agree with that. But I do think that on a continual budget, if we are getting somebody new in, obviously we've had this conversation that Emma Sanders has confirmed that we are getting um lisa was it nolson i'm sorry i'm not very good at this <clears throat> yep nolson thank you got it right can't have on fire again um but yes she said we've got that ultimately why pay wages for two players if you're only going to be using one so in that respect it makes sense doesn't it and if it is a player as you just said 20 30 40 thousand pounds potentially it's not the end of the world, really, is it? It's a, a simple enough sort of swap, and it's the sort of hit that you can potentially take um, because there wasn't really anything there in the first place. It wasn't expected money. It wasn't revenue that you were looking to to get back in again. Um, so you mentioned already about the contracts, and obviously the, 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 the thumbnail really talks about Polly Bancroft and how she's getting involved and the influence that's being felt there. Sarah, what do you think the influence is so far from Polly with regards to transfer policy. Do you think Polly's going to have had anything to do with Lucy standing forth leaving? Is it just that she might have said, that's fine, we can get you this player if you want, but you're going to have to let somebody else go because we've got to have to trim the wage bill. It's got to be a certain amount. How do you see um, Lisa, uh, not Lisa, we're back on her again, Polly's um, footprints, fingerprints effectively in all of this. What do you think her influence has been? Um. It's difficult to say because I, I, I'm not sure if like how big an influence it has been and she's only been in the job a few months. Um, I mean, ultimately, she is, you know, does have that responsibility that like I've seen a lot of people blaming Skinner for, you know, these kinds of departures, but it's not his responsibility to, you know, negotiate contracts and things. Um, so she would have an influence to a degree i'd say but i'm not it, it's hard to say at this point how big that influence is i mean maybe she did want to trim the wage bill uh, that would make sense but yeah it's it's a tricky one 
to work out at this point. I think it's probably a little too early to say. Okay, fair enough. Um, Helen, again, what's your thoughts on that? And, and with regards to what Anton's put here, he's talking about potentially poor planning. Um, working on this theory from Lanzell here that says we shouldn't have let her go for free, but if she was going to go in the summer anyway, presumably that would have been for free as well, though, because it would have been the end of her contract. So over the course of the next few months, have we really lost anything? And again, with, with Polly, where do you see her influence in what we're seeing so far? Or do you agree with Sarah that really we're, we're never going to have a clue? Um, I don't think we're going to know the, all, all the ins and outs, of course, of anyone and their role at the club because uh, Polly's um, title is head of women's football, which is quite broad, isn't it? Does that mean she has a say in transfers? Does that mean she gets overruled by someone else who's the main transfer person for the whole club? I don't know. Um, like, is, is it separate transfers for women's team, transfers for men's team? I mean, you'd like to think so, but um, does she... Like, does she have a say over Mark, over Martin? Who knows? Um, um, is she just more on the welfare side of things, like making sure the players are happy, which if they want to leave their contract midway through, then she's going to make it happen if it's in the best interest for them. Um, uh, yeah, that, I guess we, don't, we, we still don't know. I'm sort of sitting on the fence a bit again. But um, yeah, as to what her, her role, how in-depth it is, um, I mean, it could be different to how she did it at Brighton, um, depending what Man United have set as her remit or what they want from her and whether they think she can do what they want her to do or it, is, is she going to be stifled by the constraints they've put on her? I don't know. Yeah. Seems absolutely reasonable. Uh, sporting with sport face. Thinks it's too early to see what Polly's bringing to the inside of the club. And I have to be honest, I think generally I tend to agree with that. But... Mm -hmm. um, Charlie, your thoughts on what we've just spoken about and also the, the point that Sarah's made here. Is signing Lisa going to again affect uh, VBR getting minutes, do you think? So we, we, we potentially yeah. let Staniforth go. If we brought Lisa Nelson in as well, do you think that's going to push VBR down? Well, if, if Lisa's better, then yeah, it definitely should. If Lisa's a better footballer, um, then yeah, she should come in and push other people down the pecking order. That's That's the... That's what should happen. Um, I don't. I don't mean Sarah here, by the way. But I think sometimes people um, just want a player to play, regardless of if whoever is in. So even if Alex Patelis came in, people would still want certain players to be playing. Um, you just want the best possible players playing the best possible style of football for Man United for them to be successful. And that just means some players, unfortunately, become. I hate saying this, they use this at my work, collateral damage, um, which happens sort of get hit in the crossfire, don't they? Um, but yeah, and no no player is irreplaceable. If there's someone better comes along, apart from maybe Honor, I think we've said that before, there's no one better, um, then yeah, it might make it difficult. Um, but in the short term, we know it sounds like maybe that signing is going to happen, but if it doesn't, you would expect there are more opportunities for... Um, a long-standing Norwegian international like like Vilda to come and show what she can do, particularly as we hit the running um, and the FA Cup games hopefully start coming thick and fast as well. Yeah, that's interesting for me. That's a big one for me there. I've heard that as well. Sorry, I'm just having a chat now with this. No, you go for it. You like your waffle. <laughs> yeah, that's come up. That's quite... We, you sort of hear sort of rumours from a range of clubs, don't you, when they get... Um, sort of signings from overseas and you hear it in the men's game that it's quite it's more physical when you come to the UK to play football um so if if we're potentially getting someone who is more physical and can come in with deal and deal with that side of things immediately then that's a real positive isn't it because that's what we want we're talking about we want Man United to have a long-term plan for success but there is also quite the need for some immediate success if we want to continue to to develop and be fine with the big boys or girls big boys or girls Absolutely. It sounds like, according to Lanzel here, 186,000 apparently paid. Uh, Lisa, we play six to eight positions. Uh, and then it's apparent that Lanzel has lost the power of speech at the moment as he's writing. Because uh, we'll play Imena. Uh, and then, oh God, typo. <laughs> Lisa will play I mean for the price tag. But the thing that got me there was the six to eight positions. I kind of want Lanzel to tell me these positions. Because eight positions is most of the pitch. 
So I'm going to presume that holds out goalkeeper <laughs> that I need two more. So that like left back and right back, she can't do. I need more Lanzel. I need more. You've piqued my interest. So tell me more about that. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really tricky one. This we're bringing players in. It's the right thing to do. We, we talk about transfers. We want to bring players in. We want to build the squad. We want them to do more. Um, but as we've put here, for us to be successful, John, we need strength in the midfield more than we already have. Zellum, Ladbo, Reese, etc. All good players, which achieve success. We need to strengthen. But as we've said, if we're playing by Risa, let's be honest, she's in competition with two. And I think people keep on forgetting this. They seem to think that just because you can put three midfielders in, or you just name your three best midfielders, but the position they're in matters. It matters uh, immensely. You wouldn't stick Scott McTom uh, McTominay in the Bruno Fernandes role because that's not the position that he's expected to do. He's much more defensive. By the same token, you don't go stick in Vilda Barisa there, expecting her to perform to her best. It's not necessarily this the, uh, the place that she is most akin to playing. So, in terms of strengthening and leaving, do we think there's any other players that we can see sort of being on their way out over the course of the next few days? Um, Helen, we'll come to you on that one. Any ideas, any thoughts of players who you think might potentially uh, be off out? We know that Grace Clinton's being offered out as a loan. Uh, we are expecting to hear that because Mark Skinner's mentioned that in his conversation with Jamie Spencer. But uh, beyond that, any any other potential ones you think might be in danger, especially if we do sign this Lisa Nelson? Um, I'm not sure if any more will go out from the current squad, um, but maybe some that are out on loan won't return. That's what I'm thinking. Maybe Ivana, maybe Emily, because, well, Ivana didn't really play when she was here, so it's maybe she... She's thinking herself, if I come back, will I actually get minutes? I'm, I'm playing in Germany. I'm, I'm great over there. Why would I return where I'm not playing? Um, and Emily's been on loan to God knows how many clubs back and forth for various spells. So unless, God forbid, Mary were to leave, she's not going to be the number two for some reason. It doesn't seem it's going to happen for her. So, um, yeah, yeah. I know there was a bit of talk, maybe about Rachel Williams going on loan, but that doesn't make sense to me. I don't know why you'd bring her in, like any any recent player. I mean, just to send them out on loan. I know Grace Clinton, but she she's so young, and I think they've sort of oh, Mark's um, explained his reasoning behind that. So, absolutely, I think he has already said as well that uh, and has opened the dialogue now with Mary Apps with regards to. Um, getting that contract across the line. So, fingers crossed, she will sign not just the extension and we won't just have to do that, but that she'll sign a little bit longer because she has been playing out of her skin, I think. Um, Lanzel has clarified, boys and girls, here we are. Uh, he was talking about the numbers. Uh, six meaning defensive midfielder, eight meaning central midfielder, and Connor has apparently turned into my psychologist because <laughs> if I knew what he meant, I wouldn't have brought it up. I would have said it. Uh, so there, actually. But yes, thank you, Lanzel, for humouring me and helping me to realise what you meant so I can include your comments in an inclusive fashion on the channel because that's what we're after. Um, Sarah, your thoughts in terms of players um, who might be in trouble? Um, it is tricky to say. I mean, I would have said Boa Risa purely because, you know, there's been a lot of talk about her wanting the minutes and wanting to be involved for Norway. And I think the Norway coach actually had been encouraging her to consider her options as well. Um, and then with Lisa's potential arrival, you know, that kind of threw a spanner in the works as well. But I I, I don't know. I, I'd be surprised, I think, at this stage if we let another midfielder go in this window, especially with Clinton going on loan, uh, just because it would be good to have the options there. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I saw somebody somebody said suggested Jade Moore, which is interesting. Uh, because she's yeah, she hasn't been getting the minutes either. So uh maybe the most likely, I would think. Yeah, I think I would tend to agree with that as well. Um, and we are gonna ask you to talk a bit more about it. John's put it here, Charlie, but I mean the Williams one makes no sense at all, really, does it? It's, it 
I mean, yeah. aside from the fact that, I mean, bear it in mind, there would be a riot from you anyway, but considering, considering you're in a situation now where this is now become your nickname for today, Charlie Collateral <laughs> Coxon. It wouldn't be a sensible thing to do, would it, to be send Rachel Williams on loan? Um, look, again, we've just got her in, so it would be weird. But again, long term, isn't going to be the one, is she, going forward, so he's going to lead the line um, for the Champions League. I'm most interested in, and it won't be this window, but it might be next window, and I've just written, you won't be able to see it because of the thing. You can't see it, can you? But I've put centre-back WTF because I'm really interested to see what happens with four world-class centre-backs all jostling for position. That'll be interesting to me to see how that um, plays out because I think we've got the best collection of four centre-backs of anyone in the league. When you look at them as a four, no one else has got that strength in depth. So I'm interested to see what happens there. Um but there's been no talk about any of them, obviously, in this window. But I'll, I'm interested to see what happens with that going forward, having those four centre-backs. Are two of them going to be happy to long-term not be starting? So I'm interested in that, in a sort of like hide behind the sofa, um, can't look away from a car crash kind of thing. But then I suppose people say that's what you want, isn't it? You want to be able to pick from loads of world-class players. Those are really good players. Um, I just think in this window, we need to be getting a full-back in. That's my big thing is a fullback and potentially another goal scoring proper goal scoring striker but like the men's game that's impossible I think that's impossible at the moment um would you agree know. with this centre back pairing Mannion and Maya are they the two that you would kick off with if she was fully fit well no but well, well not well no because at the moment the centre back pairing that we've got hasn't done anything wrong like like, like, you look at, I know it's a women's football show, but you look at Ten Hag, like he's got his team, hasn't he? But then when someone has a nightmare, that's when they get ripped out. So Malassia didn't play for three or four games because he had a nightmare against someone, didn't he? So I can't imagine they're just going to go and pull out one of those centre-backs because Mannion's fit. Although, like, again, she's, she's brilliant, isn't she? So she'd seamlessly fit back into that. It's not a problem. But well, just the Oracle, we, otherwise known as Connor, he's saying it's going to happen soon. Yeah, it might happen. But I just think the defence, the defensive unit, that five is probably one of those things, if I was a manager, which I'm not because I'm, I'm not qualified, um, is probably the one thing you genuinely don't mess about with too much if it's actually working. And that, I don't know, like I'm, I'm, people disagree, I have no issue at all, but I probably wouldn't mix that up unless I had to. John's going. No idea, that's the beauty of Man United. No one has any freaking idea what's going on. I miss the days that you only knew <laughs> there was a signing when they were holding the shirt. <laughs> that was it. Me I too. remember when we signed Robin Van Persie. Even then, it wasn't everywhere. Just remember the ticker tape. Mm. What's the screen? Crikey, we've signed him. And Shinji Kigawa. No one saw that coming. <laughs> it is indeed a bit of a nightmare. And there was, sorry, there was just one that I wanted to catch because, yeah. there we go, it's this one here. Um, so, Aguido Brian says, let me get this straight. When we signed Builder, was she coming as a number eight or a number ten? Now, my understanding was it would have been more as a, a number 10, that she was more of an attacking midfielder. But I open the floor to you three. Where would you have gone, eight or 10? Did you ask me that? All three of you. All oh, right. <laughs> yeah, anyone wants to answer. Don't know. Can I ask Casey? I think she's a 10. Is she not a 10? I would have said a 10. Would you say 10, Helen, or an 8? Or would you like to plead the fifth? <laughs> she, you know, I, when she got three or four games, Helen, when she was really good for us like last season, was she playing as a 10 then? I think so. Tooney was pushed out wide. Oh, yeah. for that, yeah. when, was Tooney on the right for some reason in the sort of Martha Thomas role, if you like? <laughs> That's um, what I thought happened. That's yeah, what I, um, I saw with my eyes, but I, you know, I do wear glasses. I could be wrong. Didn't uh, Skinner say that she needed to work more on the defensive side of her game? I know she can play both, but yeah, so maybe, maybe that was with a with a view to put her as an eight eventually. Yeah. Because who's getting rid of Toon? Answer, spoiler alert, probably nobody uh, <laughs> would be the answer to that one. There's precious few. Uh, although, Grace Clinton, he did say, is very much the blueprint for the future. So, who knows? 
Uh, evening, Ken. Nice to meet you, sir. Very good to have you here with us. Um, and yes, sir, I, I totally agree. If it isn't broken, don't fix it. Um, Lanzel's thrown in with this Jade Riviere, who we linked with, apparently good from Canada uh, as a young fullback as well. Absolutely. I think we're all in agreement. We need, we need fullbacks. We need some people to uh, go in on that one. So Charlie's mentioned her ones that she would potentially bring in fullbacks and another striker. Is that the same for, for you two, um, Helen? Is that, would you go with? With that, is that on your wish list? Yeah, um, I think. Um, well, since Kirsty Smith left, we didn't we haven't replaced her really. I know he's been trying to play Maria as a as a right back, um, with varying success. I don't think she wants to play there. Um, and obviously, with Honor and Hannah, it's like who else? Who else have we got? Nobody really. That that natural position, um, and not on that level either. So. Yeah, I think that's the main priority. And then I, I know strikers are the, the go-to and you want someone who's consistently up there scoring. Like if we could have Sam Kerr, for instance, I know, um, or, or Katoto if, when she's fit, um, that would be a dream signing. But I think we've sort of, maybe we've got away with it so far this season with the goals coming across the team. So perhaps that's a summer one because, <clears throat> We're, we're never going to get anyone in January for that anyway. And if we do tie Russo down, could we afford to like, maybe not get it straight away, maybe for the next season? Um, That's a weird thing, isn't it? If you get another really good striker, did it change, does it change completely how we have to play as well? See, Russo scored quite well, hasn't she? And she has also been injured every season that she's been here as well. She's struggled with injuries a little bit. So it's just about keeping her fit, I think. And then you're going to be getting your 15-plus goals, aren't you? Probably in the league so. from her. I would say so. Let's take a quick look at the jury. Uh, Lanzell has said that he thinks Field is an 8, but can play a 10. Uh, Sarah, though, disagrees entirely and says, no, it's a 10. John Camode has gone for an 8. That's 2-1 to the eight. And then John Fry comes in with another eight. That's 3-1. But then Lanzell goes, yeah, so he was on the right and Field was in the 10. So that's a vote for Skinner. So that's 3-2. Uh, and then Connor just says they're not exactly too dissimilar anyway, which just goes to show why it is that, you know, shouldn't be talking about football, Connor. What's that all about? Eight and a ten of us. No, what's he on about? He's lost the plot. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like more people have gone for eight than a ten. Uh, Sarah, what would you say? is on your shopping list what would we need for the uh fulfill the positions um definitely a fallback without question um i think we we don't really have a problem with goals so i wouldn't pro i would prioritize a fallback um i think i would just be happy to see russo get that contract sorted mm. uh tie her down but yeah it'd be nice to have uh, back up, you know, in case of injury and stuff. So, yeah, but fall back definitely. That's the priority. Absolutely. Another vote for VBR is an eight. Then, so you see, Charlie, there's lots of people that seem to think that that builder is more of a playing yeah, in the fine. public role. Yeah, that's um, fine. You're not allowed to be wrong. Well, yeah, but I'm not, not, not normally. I'm joking. <laughs> I just I think, she, it. It just think she played as a 10. I think she played as a 10 when she had a little purple patch for us, I think. Is it well, a purple patch when you do well? well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's what you would call it. Um, so, yeah, lots of conversations being put in here. Um, Ken's mentioned about Brune getting her alone. She's quality, am I right, and thinking her contract is up soon. Um, I mean, it might well be... <laughs> One word answers, guys. Brune, if she was there and Mark Skinner said, yeah, I'd like to buy her, would you bring her into the team? Yes or no? Helen? No. Sarah? Yes. <laughs> Ooh, I'm one. Charlie? No. Oh, two no's and a yes. What are you saying in the chat? Bring it on. Senior Brune, are we bringing her in? Good old Siggy Bruyne. That's the one we want. Um... Sarah Sproston there, if we get ourselves another prolific striker, that would also potentially affect Leslie Stay. 100%, but are we putting ourselves and shooting ourselves in the foot because we don't know she's going to sign? Um, it's really tricky. We've been talking a little bit about Polly Bancroft's influence. Let's just round up this transfer section, really. 
with do we think Polly's going to have any say, any influence in getting these people that could potentially have a contract, but at the moment are not signed up for it. So we are looking at currently players like uh, Ramsey, Honor, Millie, Aoife, Jade and Lessie. Do we see Polly having any impact whatsoever in changing any of these players' minds? Or do you think it is all solely based around what Skinner offers, what the club can offer in terms of competitions? We have this conversation so often. But do we see Polly having any influence on that? Because I'm not convinced I do. I think I only see her as setting the parameters, maybe, within which we can work in. But I don't see as her being the one that... Yeah, I don't see Leslie Russo, for example, coming and going, do you know what, Gaffer? I wasn't going to sign a contract, but I've just had a cracking chat with Polly and um, I'm, I'm up for it. I'm down. Let's sign. So yeah, maybe I've got a very naive view of football. I don't know. But what do you guys think there, Helen? I think for a footballer, especially a female footballer, they have to think of their career. So maybe not so much about earning money, although that's coming into it more because um, you can get more sponsorship perhaps to like, subsidise your wage if your wage isn't brilliant. Um, but, it, you know, it'll be enough to live on. Um, but for your career, it's so short in terms of, you know, you might retire at 35, which doesn't seem very old at all. But um, So I think for their career and winning things, they want to be, that's probably their priority because, you can make as many friends as you like in any team and they'll still be there when you've moved on. So I think most of the will they, won't they signing will be for their career and, and perhaps personally for them what they want from their career. Is it trophies or is it just a happy place to enjoy what they do? I don't know. Absolutely. And Sarah, uh, Sporty's put here, Polly may potentially have more clout when the sale of the club is sorted out. Is that something we should take into account as well? Uh, maybe, yeah. But I I agree with Helen. I think, you know, ambition comes into it. Do you want to win trophies? Do you want to play in the Champions League? And that, uh, I reckon a few of them will probably hold out for that. Uh, and I think whether or not we get Champions League next season will it'll be very interesting to see the effect that that has on some of the players' decisions. Okay, there we go. And Charlie, how influential do you think Polly is when it comes to contracts? Um, I don't... I, I, imagine she would, I imagine she would have a some sort of say on it because the whole point of getting her in was the fact that, was it John Murto was just spread too thin anyway, so... With everything else that's going on at the club, I'd imagine she's got some say over that, but obviously she's going to have to get permission for, from someone, I'd imagine, for things to go through. I wouldn't want Mark Skinner to be solely responsible for that. His his job is to be coaching the football club and setting up and getting them prepared on a, on a week-by-week -week basis. Um, I think there is probably something in in those sort of what we'd class maybe our star players um, in them waiting for to see what happens with regards to Champions League football. I think it is inevitable it will happen at some point um, that we will get it because we're Manchester United um, and we don't really stand for mediocrity. We can see what's going on at the club now. Um, some of the changes that are starting to be made with regards to culture and other things. What I would say is that the players who are doing that, I really hope that they continue to do their bit to ensure that we get there. Um, and I also have no issue with... like we, we don't know what the club's offered. The club might have offered... X, Y, and Z, and then the players come back and said, well, if you're offering me that, I also want A, B, and C, and the club have gone, fine, no problem, you can have that. Well, okay, if you're saying that, then I want this as well. And actually, it can reach a point where I have no issue with the club going, do you know what? We've offered you the best. The best we can possibly offer you, we've offered you, and now you make a decision. And if you don't want it, then you don't want it. Um, I think there has to be a cut-off point before you start. Like you, you don't want to develop in the women's game what happened in the men's game, which is... I'm not saying this is happening, but we see in the men's game that players hold clubs to ransom. I'm, I'm not really fussed about that happening in the women's game. This is what we can offer. If you wait for Champions League football, that's brilliant. No problem. That's what we're aiming for. But if the club, if we get Champions League football and, and the club have made really offers and players don't want it, then off you go then. No, no problem. But you see, it's, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that because I always think to myself, when you think about players, especially on the men's side, 
you always think to yourself, and again, it's a naive view of football, I understand that, but you get to a point where you think there's a bit of loyalty. The club's brought you up, helped you get to the level that you're at. Just sign another contract. Even if you've got like the, the gentleman's agreement that at the end of the season, if we haven't made Champions League football, mm. we'll sell you. We'll let you go somewhere. And someone like Leslie Russo, we've started this conversation with Lucy Staniforth and potentially getting £7.50 and a packet of salt and vinegar, you know, that sort of thing. But ultimately, Leslie Russo is the sort of player that could be going for £200,000, £300,000, £400,000 potentially and pushing the, um, the sort of the signings that we've been looking at at the top end, don't we think? So is there not an element there also of if you're going to be savvy about your, your transfers that actually this is where you need to be thinking about having those conversations to try and extend it even if you are considering doing the sale so that it safeguards the club and allows them to get a fee um, and, and that's how the game progresses because if you just let your best players go at the end of the season for free because we couldn't sort out a contract that's surely where the game falls down don't you think Sarah? Yeah absolutely um, I mean you know, obviously not everyone, like the likes of Ella Toon, it's like absolutely no doubt, like she's united through and through. That's where she wants to be. You obviously won't get that from everybody, but yeah, I yeah, I don't disagree with anything you said there, to be um, honest. What, what I would hope is that if, um, if, if the club are waiting on players to make decisions later on, I would hope that now there are contingency plans in place. So they're not the club aren't just sitting on waiting until May last game of the season to see if we qualify and then going, oh crap, we didn't. So we've got to go and get ourselves a striker and a world class fullback now, and we still need a backup one. Like I would expect that there are things happening, um, contacts being made and people being spoken to that if if this happens, if this player doesn't stay, we need to have something in place. And again, that is what you would hope is happening with a club that has the stature of Man United. You'd hope that those things are happening. Yeah, Helen, anything you'd, you'd add or, or want to throw in on all of that? Um, just I think that hopefully Polly's experience at Brighton in a similar role will bring that to the club because it's been, um, I think, said before that Man United were quite naive in their women's team. They didn't really know how to how to form one they just almost did it as a, a tick box exercise it seemed um so hopefully she can bring her knowledge and stability to that side of things and i think just on the the champions league issue with players i'd be worried that they don't just want to sort of dip their toe in the champions league and then go out on the first first game or first qualifying uh, match that they want champions league longevity if they can get it so I think that would be, not that you can promise that, of course, but if they don't think the club's going in the right direction, then, you know, they won't. If they don't think they'll be in season after season, then they won't They won't sign. <laughs> the WSL is increasingly getting so competitive, isn't it? Like, it, it's so, obviously, you've got the four to begin with, with three places, but you can, I know I joked about it early, but you can see what they're trying to do at Villa and, and you can see they're starting to make progress at Everton and, and Spurs are throwing money about. So it is so competitive. It's like you, like when you look at the men's side of things, you think there's like four Champions League places and there's like eight or nine teams, like some massive teams are going to miss out. And increasingly that's going to be the case in the WSL, I think. Because I do believe, I'm not saying the WSL has the best teams in Europe, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is when you look at the competition for Champions League places, I think it's more difficult to get it unless you're Chelsea. Like increasingly, it's going to be more difficult to finish in one of those positions. Absolutely. I think I agree with you on that one. We're going to get back to the serious stuff in just a second. But Charlie, banging news. It was 4-2. Yehuda has pumped in with sticking VBR at a 10. Chris I thought you were making it like a signing announcement. Leveled it up to a 10 as well. <laughs> And we are all of a sudden sat here at four all. So <laughs> it stands, VBR could be a could be a ten. Um, we also had to ask you to get involved and tell us whether you would take Senior Bruin uh, between the three of us here, or three the you three. I didn't put a vote in. It was two no's and one yes. I think uh, I can confirm. Basically, if we're buying her, it's a no. Uh, John <laughs> voted three times, but they wouldn't mind as a loan 
tends to be John Fry was capitalised. He shouted at the screen. Uh, Anton seems nobody wants Brune. Um, so there we go. But I can confirm, I'm pretty sure I saw Connor say uh, yes to a loan, potentially, but not to a, uh, a sale, which makes complete sense in my mind. Um, right, we've got here. The one thing, Carol, nice to see you. The one thing I think might draw Lessie away is if Casey Stoney comes knocking again. She's known Lessie for years. Possibly, um, if Casey does come along, that could happen. You absolutely never know. Right, I want to get to our meaty part of the topic, um, which has been it's been grinding my gears for a while. Actually, I've been really annoyed about this ever since I started writing in my diary. Um, one of the it has genuinely right. People have uh, I've got this nice for, for Christmas. Oh. You've got your nice Manchester United diary, and I thought, you know what? Um, it was very nice of one of the children to buy that, and I said, well, I'm going to use this. So I I plan in here all of my AFU content and everything that's going on, and all of the matches that I'm going to be going to. It's my football diary, everything that's going in on it. So I sat here at the weekend. I'm writing down all of my dates, and of course, it was really annoying to notice that when we got towards the end of May that some absolute moron had decided that Sunday the 28th of May was a good day for the men's team to finish their season and for the women's team to finish their season. Now, we might argue that it might have fallen reasonably nicely because Manchester United women will be playing Liverpool away and Fulham at home for the men's team. But beyond all of that, it just wound me up <clears throat> because... I don't feel that football supporters should be left in a position where they've got to choose, especially not when you're talking about your first team for your men and your first team for your women. What has happened, and Charlie, I think you'll fall in with this or with me on that, but we know people who've got tickets to go and see the men and season tickets to go at home and season tickets for the women as well, who are more than likely going to buy tickets to go to Liverpool away. The problem is the choice of being able to do that. If the women are playing, it's a two o'clock kickoff, which I would assume is when we would be looking at, that game doesn't finish until four o'clock. And then all of a sudden, you've got to try and get yourself to Old Trafford for that game. Now, even if they move it earlier and go 12 o'clock, or if they moved it later for six o'clock, it's going to be a real tricky one to try and get people in numbers. And I'm, I'm actually a bit worried that we could be sat here in a situation where we need to go to Liverpool to make it to the top three or to win the title, potentially. And people are then going to have to make their decision. Do they go to watch the Fulham game or do they go to watch the Liverpool game? And I don't think anyone should be left in that position. I don't think we should be sat here as fans choosing what we do. If you're an armchair fan, it's nice and easy. We'll whack that one on and then we'll whack that one on. It's nice and simple. But for the match-going fans, it's not very helpful. And I just think this is like the last thing, the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of thinking about how at the moment the women's game is seeming a bit more of an afterthought than what the men were doing. There's been all of this talk about the ACL injuries and how many the women are getting. And I'm just, am I just ranting into a space where nobody really cares? Because it's, it, it's bothering me. It's bothering me. Does it bother any of you three that it doesn't seem to be being thought through? <laughs> these people in charge and we're talking about influence so the next bit will be how we influence that but first of all is this even a topic or have I just built up something that mm. frankly nobody really cares about yeah. so get the comments with that Helen what's your thoughts um I think it, it's quite short-sighted um because when they have the the women's football weekends that's promoted as a big thing it's deliberately not when there's men's games on um, even the start of the WSL, um, like that's is that in line with the men's game? I can't quite remember, but I wonder if this season is is hampered a bit with the World Cup last year and the Women's World Cup this year. Have they just had to try and keep to a calendar and everyone finishes at the same time? I don't know, but yeah, to have have it on the same day when probably the games will. I mean, mo most of the last games of the season kick off the same time, don't they, for the Premier League and the WSL? Um, so yeah, I think it, I think it is an mm. oversight for the definitely for the match-going fans. Which um, in the women's game, they they keep um, saying we want um, what's it, people in the stadium, we want crowds. So 
they they need to do more to look at these things to stop the the overlap. I think. Good. I'm glad it's not just me. And and Charlie was talking about how the WSL is becoming more competitive. We're getting more teams that are really starting to get involved and to 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 challenge the top four and to potentially get themselves into that sort of situation. Um, Sarah, Sporty's put here, if it had to be that weekend, why not put the WSL on Saturday and the Premier League on Sunday? There's two days on that weekend. If you if on the, the Premier League has always finished on a Sunday, from what I can remember, I've got no problems with that. So shift the women across. It's not a problem if they're going to do that. Or keep the men on the Saturday because it's the World Cup that's done this, let's not forget. That ridiculous World Cup in the middle of Christmas when everyone was trying to enjoy themselves rather than watching all these teams play in Qatar. Sarah, where would you go with that? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned women's football weekend and like the whole idea behind that obviously is to cut on you know, the absence of men's club games that weekend to encourage attendance at women's games but like what's the point in having that if you're then going to prevent people from attending both at the end of the season it just it doesn't make sense to kind of to promote it and then sort of take it away from people in the end um so yeah I don't know who's behind this decision but it's definitely the wrong decision and it just sort of raises the question like is is women's football only important when there are no men's matches to watch? So that's kind of how I feel about it. 100%. I, I think that's got to be right. Um, Charlie, where, where, where do you stand on all of this? Um, I don't, I might have this wrong, but I don't, I don't know if it's the same group of people or person making both of these decisions. So I feel like it's the Premier League making the decisions kind of obviously TV picks have a bit of a say don't they on, on the fixtures and then the FA for the women's football I mean someone can correct me if I'm wrong so if that's the case it's kind of like everyone's looking out for their best interests or the FA isn't going hang on this isn't a good idea actually we're going to go for Sunday instead um which you would think would be fairly straightforward um so yeah it is frustrating like you would I think you're going to get a core group of fans who are going to go and watch the women's games anyway. So I, I would do that regardless. I would go and watch the, the women play. That would be my my priority. Oh, good. I haven't made that up. I thought that was the case. So what you'd benefit from, like what I'd really like is for the Premier League to come in and say, we'll have that actually. Or one of them, the Premier League to go, we want to organise the women's football calendar. And then I think what you'd find is there's less, there's less of these sorts of issues happening. And then you'd probably get better advertising, like double headers and things. Yeah. Like the, this weekend, massive Man United this weekend, Man United against Man City derby. And then then you can watch uh, the women um, batter relegation fodder Liverpool women um, also. Now, which one people... I would hope that people would go to the one that's got more jeopardy. That's what tends to happen. But I worry that that could be both. <laughs> that could be both games on the last day of the season, couldn't it? It could be both of those teams trying to get or playing to get Champions League football. Um, but yeah, it's just a frustrating, it's it's either um, an oversight, which is lazy, or someone making a decision doesn't care. And they're both horrendous. Probably the slightly better one is complacency, a bit of an oversight, because it's not a deliberate thing. Um, but yeah, it's frustrating that it, it can't just be on a separate day. It's bizarre. Even if it's separate people making decisions with their own interests, surely it's in everyone's best interest that they're not <clears> on the same day. It's ba it's baffling to me. It's bamboozling when there's it, no need. It is. It's mind boggling, hundred percent. And I mean, I think there's so many things here. Like Anton's put the Premier League can't even schedule their own matches properly. <laughs> so the cut replay overlaps and all the clubs. <clears> but this is the thing, isn't it? There's so many different competitions even on the men's side you look at that FIFA want FIFA wants to put things in they want to put in a club world championships now for the women as well you know we've not even got a league system that's thoroughly working for all of the people that are inside of it but oh no let's stick in a club world cup um for some of these teams it's, it's it just feels to me like they've all got it a little bit skew with I was reading somewhere that there's been an international tournament for the women for every year in the last five years that's crazy. That would never happen on the men's side. They wouldn't do that where they have a summer where you haven't had an opportunity to rest before your season begins. So 
I mean, again, this we, we're talking about these supercomputers that make the fixtures. Is this something we can do? Because football teams across the genders, you've got the, the men's main team, there'd be the under-23 teams. I'm not going to go too much into the youth teams because they get a smattering of followers and that just depends on if anything else is happening. But equally, you've got the women's side as well. Are we asking too much that these fixtures are looked at properly and left in a position whereby you, you could attend them? Is, is there a bit too much? I mean, I don't know. There's there's, there's three yeah. games potentially there. I'll just open the floor on this one. If people want to jump in, let's just jump in and, and, and argue and talk amongst each other and get and angry if we want to, because I, I'm just I'm flabbergasted. But I'm also unsure. Is it something we could do? Because that's a lot of a lot of organisation, I would have thought. But computers can do amazing things. You know, they can zoom into satellites. We can see Mars. We can see all of these things. You would think it would be quite easy to sort out a fixtures calendar so that fans for football clubs could actually see their team. Um, yeah, I, I actually, I saw it suggested recently that there should be more women's games at Old Trafford during the season rather than, you know, just the one or... Um, now, obviously, like there's a whole other argument to be made there about crowds and like we talked before about, you know, the crowd for the Villa game and everything. But um, like, I wonder is, could you, you know, there's even just uh, on weekends maybe where both teams, men's and women's teams would be playing at home because obviously it wouldn't work for the end of this season. But um, could you have like a double header maybe? let people attend both games have them both at old trafford if they're on the same day i mean i know there's a, there would be a lot of organization involved but surely it would be a possibility in some cases you don't want to come in with what sarah's put here if they can't organize where both teams aren't playing the same day how can people want women's teams playing the men's stadiums regularly you know, it's going to be a difficult thing to do, isn't it? If you want these organisations to eventually, I think Tim Stillman's put out that Arsenal are, are selling 40,000 tickets for the third time so far this season. Uh, for a game, obviously, in the end, it's not in Boreham Wood. Good Lord, could you imagine trying to get 40,000 people in there? That would be unbelievable. That would have, that'd be a roof for Boreham Wood with everything just like a milk bottle igloo. But, you know, they, they, they've got to find a way I've got some amazing thoughts that go on in my head, Charlie. I don't know what to say. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? And they're all just nicely pushed together. Um, but go on, Charlie, you can come in with this. What, what well, do you think? I f well, I feel yeah. like Arsenal have done a really good job of pushing it. Like Arsenal as a whole, as an entire football club, rather than it being Arsenal women as an isolated thing trying to drive it. I think they've done an incredible job. I loathe to say anyone does anything better than us. That happens a lot at the moment, um, but they've they've pushed that so well. Um, it's all it's also been helpful, I think, for them that it's been the right type of opponent. So it was Spurs, us, and is it Chelsea? Is it Chelsea this weekend? Yeah. Um, but yeah, they've just done a really good job. Um, and again, I think our, you look at Arsenal women; they're probably should be playing in a bigger stadium, maybe one our size at least, because they're they're selling out Boreham Wood, aren't they, against everyone really every week? Um, but yeah, if, if the if the desire is there and if people want it, then why not? But I think, like we're saying, there's there's, there's so many issues at the moment with when teams are playing, um, teams not being able to play because the pitch needs to be used for the actual, the real team who might need to train on there next week. Like we've seen that happen to Spurs, haven't we, a couple of times. Um, and I just think, yeah, I like the idea of more women's games in stadiums, but like from a selfish point of view, I kind of like LSV as being a little bit of our fortress. Like, I think it's good that we have games at Old Trafford, but I wouldn't want it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There needs to be some sort of consistency um, with yeah. regards to playing your home fixtures. So just have to see what happens. So Helen, do you think that's part of the problem then? Is that actually because we're not filling out places like LSV, so actually it's a smaller attendance, that that's part of the reason why it's not necessarily thought of um, immediately of there being a clash that actually they get less than 10,000 anyway. So why not just go and fill uh, Old Trafford up with its 70,000? Is that part of it, do you think? Yeah, and I think um, fans are always going to be many steps ahead of the, 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 um, the teams and the, the league's hierarchy in terms of what they want for the for their game for the 
for the for the growth of the game as a whole. So I think well, the, simply because the women's game was you know, outlawed for so long and it's so behind the men's game through no fault of its own, um, the men's team is always going to come first. And it, and I don't agree with it because I think there there are solutions, there are ways to have them equal. I mean, no one wants well. We're not asking for it to be better, you know, promoted further than the men's game. We just want it equal. Um, and I think it, going back to Arsenal, I think they did do a double header match, the women's team and the men's team. Um, on, uh, I think they were both at the Emirates. Um, I, don't, I can't remember the the type of fixture it was, whether it was a league match, probably not, but maybe a pre-season something. Um, I think I think I only remember it because um, uh, Daniel Carter had a knee injury again straight after coming back from one. So, but yeah, I think the women's team was first, and then the men's team played later on. So, it's doable to, as Sarah said, you know, share the ground with a double header. But yeah, just it's you always get the feeling as a fan the women's team is an afterthought or it's not as important. Which I think we need to move on from that by now. You know, we're past that. <laughs> And I would, I would, um, sorry, I would agree that you know it wouldn't be feasible to have like too many games at Old Trafford. Obviously, you know, LSV is their home, and that's where the loyal fans will always go and everything. But you know, even just more than one game a season would be like it could be something that would be looked into the possibility of having a men's and a women's game on the same day to just even as an experiment see how it works out. And, and if you could do it again going forward. It would be a really interesting thing um, because, I mean, I, I sit there and think to myself how that would work because I've spoken to a few people about that. If you were to watch the men's team first and then stay and watch the women's team or would you watch the women's team first, there'd then have to be a gap because presumably it's impossible to get a, a ticket quite often for the for the Man United men's games at the weekend. So, you know, there's going to have to be a sort of potentially a filing out of some people. Would some of them stay? You'd like to think so. But would you then end up in a situation where a lot of the season ticket holders for the men drive out some of the people that have been watching the girls' game for such a long time? It's There's so many questions that need to be answered, but I think that's why the, the conversation needs to be um, brought up. We're going to come back very quickly to, to end the story, but Connor, uh, no, that's not what I wanted to throw up. You were there a second ago. There you are. That's the one we wanted. A what, Barry? A milk bottle igloo. Um, this is one that I built in, in a school that I worked at once, and it's rather cool. So a milk bottle igloo is literally what you mean. It's a load of milk bottles, all eventually glue gun together, but they're all just squeezed together like that to create a roof uh, and an entrance for you to get in. Uh, and I apologise that that wasn't the image that you needed, Carol. Um, but Connor does need to learn because he still eats burgers with knives and forks. So, you know lots of things that he needs to learn um brilliant the last thing i wanted to bring up with regards to all of this um, which was quite serious i thought was that whilst we're talking about this equality there's a lot of people i think that seems to throw out at the moment that the women's game is just after equality for money and that we should be paying them the same amount and all that sort of thing and i don't really think that that's the rallying call that i'm hearing from people within the women's game i think and we just spoke about this in our private chat just to see if i was getting the right story because you know i don't always but um leah williamson obviously was talking a lot about the equality in terms of looking into the game i mean Bron, what is it 50 odd acls across the the place that's that's going on at the moment and that's absolutely mad but she was also talking about the endometriosis and all of these things that are happening within the women's game and within the women's bodies that aren't necessarily being looked into enough and it would be madness. We're looking at players like Mead, Amar and Mead. Now, don't get me wrong. When you sit here as a Manchester United fan and you hear that the top two players from the Arsenal women's team aren't going to be available, it's perfectly natural to sit there and go, see, now I told you we had a chance of winning the title. But I don't even feel like I can really say that because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking it's really rubbish that two of the best players in the league have hurt themselves and it's not just them because you're then looking at other players players in Chelsea it's happened to it's happened to us with Ethan Mannion it's mad that these sort of things are happening so where I wanted to go with, with the last bit is we've been talking about influence what can we do 
as a footballing community? What can Polly Bancroft do? What can Manchester United as a club do? How do we get to a point where women's football isn't just the afterthought? Because I appreciate all the money, all the sponsorship at the moment is on the men's side. I get that. Most of the attendance is over there. That's not the argument. What do we need to do to ensure that women's football is being taken seriously in these respects? Because you can't have your top assets out of the game all of the time. What, what do we need to do? Um, and Charlie, I'll kick off with you on that one, I think. Um, well, again, it's that... It's, it's continuing to speak up, isn't it? There's all sorts of issues. There's issues like the football boots as well. They just wear men's football boots, really, but just in short, smaller sizes. So they're not being properly created for females. But I think I think lots of people who support women's football and who have an interest in it, I think they do speak up often. Like, see all sorts of shows around and articles that people write and journalists. But there needs to be more from other people just involved in football generally. So not just, oh, it's a, it's a women's football problem, so it just needs to be the women's clubs talk, sorting this out and it needs to be their physios looking at it. It needs to be a bigger thing. And it's like everything to do with women's football. You need the backing of the entire football community. And I don't think it'll be until we get that or that continues to develop that side of things that we'll see massive changes, which is a shame. But I think anything to do with women's football, it needs to be more than just the people that are already in it. It needs to be other people outside who want to push to help make these changes as well. And that that's the most difficult thing. It's that, oh, we don't care. I don't like it. It's that mentality that we're trying to break through at the moment, aren't we? Whereas yeah, my, friend, my friend at work said to me, she was joking, but she said to me, if men had periods, they'd have found a way to stop them by now. <laughs> they'd have found a way for those to not happen, but everything would still be fine. There'd still be reproduction. There'd be all these things. It'd be absolutely fine. Um, and we just need we just need people to to step up. So we need people higher up to care enough to want to make this better. And again, I think it will only come down to as it develops and there is more money involved. And it's a shame to say, but I think that's probably it. You don't want your star players all out injured. The people that are going to sell the game to the masses, if you're making a lot of money, you don't want them unavailable. You want them at the World Cup, don't you? Because they're going to draw crowds in. So we can keep doing what we're doing and, and the, the women's side of the clubs can keep doing what they're doing, which is trying to do the right things and the journalists as well. But it needs to be a, a bigger approach from, from people that have more clout at the moment. Which is a bit negative, but I think I think that's probably where we're at. I mean, I think it's true, though. I mean, um, Sarah, from what, what Carol put here, you know, months ago, Russo said she doesn't want equal play, pay. Is there still a way to go till then? It's just equal equity. Pay. Is equity. Absolutely. And that's the thing. It's the you difference between equality and equity. Equality and equity. You can't have equality. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. You can't have it. But you can have equity so you can provide opportunities for people to reach the potential that they need. 100%. That's what it is. Because if you give everyone equality, <clears throat> everyone be driving around in a in a Ferrari. They don't need that. People need the means to get to where they need to be. And, Absolutely. And, and there's always been, there's a, a brilliant one that we use it in classes that we've taught before, where you've got the fence and then there's three people and there's one person looking over the fence. It's all well, you know, their head's there. They're like, oh, that's brilliant. I can see the match. And you've got someone else who's sort of eyes are sort of just about there, but they can't really see them. There's somebody else who's missing entirely. And they're all stood on the same box. They've got the same level box. Mm -hmm. and that's quality. We've given you all a box, but it doesn't matter because one of you is the only one who can see over the, the fence properly. Uh, and I think that's what, what Sarah's getting to here. It's that different support. It's the equity, like you said. Some people require two boxes, like me and you, Charlie, to be able to see over the fence because, yeah. you know, we're just not tall enough to see over the fence. <clears throat> uh, but that's about us being able to enjoy the same benefits and enjoy the same um, joy, I suppose, more than anything, because let's be honest, we're, we're not here for a long time, are we? So we should all be able to enjoy ourselves and, and get to our maximum. Um so, so, Sarah, where, where do you go with all of this? What do you think is, is necessary to move this um, on? I, I completely agree with everything Charlie said and some of the comments as well. Um, you like women can talk about this stuff and it's great. And, you know, women need specific supports. Um, but I think also it's important that men join that conversation and not just in sport, but in a general sense as well. Like we know that women's health care in general is you know like kind of people don't talk openly about it and what's needed um when phil neville was managing 
the England women's team, actually, I think there was some, there was a bit of horror when he started talking about periods in a press conference and just saying that he had learned so much about it just from managing a women's team. Um, I think that was a really good contribution to the discussion. So I think it just needs to be more open. I think men need to listen to women and need to, you know, contribute their own ideas as well and get uh, just even more female medics or, you know, just involved. I think Anton had, uh, I liked Anton's comment there about research. Uh, most of the research comes from men's sports at the moment, and that just, that's not going to apply very well to women's sports um, with, with certain issues. So, yeah, just, it's a, it's a difficult one. It'll take time, but I think just making sure that that conversation is open and we're hearing plenty of voices is a good way to start. I'm, I'm, I think back, Helen, to, to, to the club that I'm near to here, Stevenage, and, you know, they play every single week pretty much on a 3G pitch. You know, it's, it's very rare that they get to go and play out on grass. Do, do you think there's an element of that as well as we, we're lower down in the league, that actually the facilities they're using, you know, don't get me wrong, they're great in, in being all weather pitches, so they, they don't often freeze over and such like. They're quite good to use, but, you know, they could be quite sore on the knees as well. And it, it's, it's not easy if you're playing and training on that sort of pitch every single day. Um, you know, wh where do you stand on all of this? What do you feel needs to occur? Uh, yeah, just agreeing with everyone, really. Um, unfortunately, the power is still on the men's side, the influence, the money, for the most part. I mean, you could argue the most influential um, known figure in women's football for the for the coaches, you know, someone like Emma Hayes, um, Hope Powell, whatever influence she might have, um, uh, Baroness Sue Campbell, these are all top women at the top of their game, but you know, the further up than that, it's probably all men. You know, the owners of the clubs, the the directors. How many women are in in the on the board of directors at each club? Um, the medical teams. If we're, we're looking at women's medical care and the physiolog physiological side of it, um, yeah, we just, as Sarah said, like just women contributing and, and men learning from women about what they need. No worries. Thank you very much. Um, so I suppose really the last thing that I wanted to mention was, uh, and Charlie's just had to dip out. She's just had uh, one of her children waking up. Um, so she's got to go and play mum to them, which is absolutely cool. Um, but you mentioned it just there, Sarah, towards the end of what you were saying. Do you think there's a little bit there of almost like a societal change that needs to happen, that it's it's sort of a change, like you said, there, there was shock at the fact that, that Phil Neville was talking about periods and that sort of thing. Uh, and actually it's something that's almost been sort of hidden away, something that's taboo. We don't talk about it too much, you know. Um, it's always just been called women's problems, you know. Um, I've certainly had it in the workplace. You, you, you turn around and go, oh, what's wrong, with, you know, what's wrong with Sarah? And I go, oh, it's her time in the month. And that's all for leave that one alone then off off you go is it a case of that you know i'm not saying that we just need to be wandering around and, and talking about it absolutely everywhere because obviously it's still about right to privacy and that sort of thing but that we're just more open with it that we're able to talk more about sort of what's wrong with us with the, within the circles of people that we want to um talk out of it and to feel safe is that sort of really where we're going with this yeah, I think so. Um, obviously, right to privacy, like you said, but it should be it should be an option. It's about people feeling like they can go to someone and talk about what they're going through. If you know, feeling comfortable enough to do that, and that they'll be heard and listened to, and they'll be given support. Um, so yeah, I think definitely it's about societal changes. I mean, there's just so many. There's obviously still taboos in the men's game as well. Like there, it's been a discussion for years about, um, you know, sexuality. Um, how many openly gay male footballers are there? Not mm -hmm. not many. That sort of thing. Um, which obviously, obviously, I think the women's game is a lot further in that sense. Um, of you know, a lot of players have said that they just feel like it's an inclusive environment and 
they can be open about things and be supported. Um, so, yeah, I think obviously that needs to happen on, on both sides in the men's and women's games in different ways. But yeah, it's about being able to share your concerns with trusted people, I think. Absolutely. Well, I genuinely hope that that is something that's going to happen. I mean, it's not going to happen just from the sake of this podcast, but certainly um, I think Sarah's point here is is the big one, really. We've come back to it. Do you think they wait and see if the hype of the women's team continues to grow? In my opinion, it will and it should. And I think if there is one thing that, from, from my point of view as an observer and looking at it from the outside, it is growing. The women's game is massively growing. And it's quite clear that's happening. Um, will it ever get to the level as it was with the Dick Kerr ladies back in the day? I certainly hope so, because for me, I feel like women's football at the moment has that raw appeal to not just the working classes, but to people that enjoy football in its purest form, as it did back in the day when you used to see all the lovely old men and women with their little wooden clacker things going around back in the 60s. You know, see the I had the we won the cup, all that sort of jazz um, back in the day. And I think that's what's sort of growing here is that people are starting to balk a little bit at the amount of money that's being spent in the men's game and thinking, Do you know what, you know, this is how football should be. So that's my two pennies worth. I really do hope that that continues. Girls, I want to thank you so much. It's been absolutely brilliant um, having you all on. Sarah is going to finish it off again with this one. She does talk about it well. It does need to be society changing. Uh, and we are that society. Um, we are the ones that need to have those conversations. And that's why I was so delighted to be able to have you three girls on um, to, to talk about it. Because <clears throat> it's very much your story, not mine. But I'm glad we've been able to give a little bit of a platform for you guys to be able to talk about that. Thank you, everybody who's been in the comments. It's been absolutely superb having you all. We've spoken about everything. Would you believe that this conversation that ended with some relatively heavy talk, but some real talk that I think was needed, um, <clears throat> started with Lucy Staniforth leaving. How do you get from Lucy Staniforth to talking about societal change? I'll tell you how you watch all for United WFC, because this is where the conversation is at. Um, right. Thank you. Like I said, what we're doing this week, Friday, we have got Liverpool, would you believe? Yeah, Liverpool at home. And it could be the biggest crowd at LSV yet. You want to find out more about that? You're going to have to tune in on Friday night. As I said, I'm not going to be here, uh, but Connor will be. And he's had, I don't want to surprise you too much, but he's had a haircut. So it's worth tuning in just to have a look at that, if I'm honest with you. So <clears throat> get yourself on Friday evening, 7 o'clock, for the Liverpool preview with Connor and guests. He'll tweet all about that. If you haven't sent through your predictions for the predictions leak yet, what are you waiting for? Not much is going to change between now and Friday. Come on, get them in. We'll start updating them. It means I haven't got to chase quite so many people. And uh, Sunday will be Liverpool. We'll be back Monday. That's when you'll get to see me again. Um, Sarah and Helen, we hope we get to see you again. Thanks again to Charlie for being on. You've all been absolute legends. And it is time to say goodbye. See you all next week. <laughs>